Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and, and, and good evening, depending on, on where you are. This is the uh, from the not so sunny hills of Switzerland. Uh, we are here for the China Weekly Hangout, and my name is Von Steinster. I'm uh, mostly running the China Speakers Bureau, but once a week we take off an hour to discuss some uh, China-related issues, and very happy to have uh, some uh, guests here. Today, uh, Africa is on the uh, on the agenda, uh, and especially uh, we are happy to have Eric Hollander here, who is running the uh, China Africa project, doing uh, nice board, uh, podcasts about that. Uh, so, and, and Lara Ferrer, who is working both with uh, used to work with CNN. We have to. Uh, uh, work on the affiliation later and River Young from Beijing, isn't it, River? Yeah. Uh, first an apology, this is emerging technology. So uh, last week we uh, we had some people falling out. Uh, it's 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 still uh, so apology in advance because if I fall out I cannot um, well we have a disaster and I cannot apologize <laughs> then. It, uh, uh, people who are not in the chat, they can invite themselves by sending uh, messages on Twitter or Google Plus or on the YouTube uh, 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 toolbox. They should add the uh, CHW, CHW uh, hashtag. So we see it in our, in our toolbox and we can see what is uh, happening there. Uh, we actually have our first uh, message already before we start from Winslow. Uh, that's that's um, that, that's how it works. So if you send a message over Twitter and and uh, otherwise, then uh, um, we can put it here online. Uh, next week we are going to do another uh, uh, session on media, but then on the Hong Kong media. Like Hong Kong media used to be in the 1990s and. Uh, a kind of bacon of uh, of, uh, of of hope for, for 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 media, and that has changed quite a lot. And uh, next week we have at least uh, Paul Fox of the Hong Kong University lecturer there who will explain how 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 bad it is in in Hong Kong or how good it is in Hong Kong and how uh, how also the social media have changed the landscape there uh, dramatically. Now, back to the subject of today, um, um, when I saw uh, Eric Ollander working on his Africa stuff, it, 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 it was obvious that we could not deal with, with Africa in, uh, in full. We, we had to limit it a bit. So what we are going to do is uh, today talk about the media, uh, the Chinese media in Africa. And, 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 and the good thing is both uh, Eric and, and Lara will introduce themselves shortly. As an, and, and both of them have an affiliation with uh, CNN, or used to have that. And, and if they can elaborate a bit on that, because both Al Jazeera and now also the Chinese see CNN as a kind of example of what they seem to want to be doing. And Eric, maybe you want to kick off there. Sure. Um, well, I'll just give a little bit of a background. Uh, I've been a journalist for 25 years. I uh, started when I was 18 in Taiwan, uh, worked at CNBC, CNN, the BBC, you know, the alphabet soup, AP correspondent in Beijing. Um, my background actually is in African history. Um, you know, I, was, I lived in the Congo, and I went back and forth to the Congo in the, in the mid-2000s to the late 2000s. And the first time I went to Kinshasa, there was virtually no Chinese. There was one Chinese restaurant, you know, in Kinshasa. And then, uh, and then, within five years, the entire business class of the Air France flight from Paris to uh, to Kinshasa is full, and there's probably somewhere in the range of ten thousand Chinese that now live in Greater Kinshasa and in, in somewhere in the environs there. So, um, so the change to me was 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 just so incredible to watch how quickly this ramped up. Uh, meantime, the same frustration that I was when I was talking to Reuters colleagues and AP colleagues and I, you know, ITN. Um, they were trying to pitch stories about, uh, you know, that challenged the narrative both of the Chinese and of, of Congo to their editors in London and Paris and New York, and they didn't want anything of it. I, I later moved to, to Radio France International in Paris, and I tried to pitch stories about the Chinese in Africa, and, you, you know, it was just, you, you know, it didn't fit within the, any of the narratives that they, were, they, that they understood. So that's when I just grew so fed up with how the media was portraying 
the story in these very, very kind of caricature style uh, reporting um, that I decided to go out on my own and, you know, create a podcast, Twitter feed, Facebook community. We have now 40,000 people on our Facebook community uh, at China Africa Project. 80% uh, of those 40,000 people are 18 to 24 year olds from Africa. This is, and this is what's so fascinating now, is that young people are absolutely engaged in this topic, and there is a clear generational shift. And I have a blog post that says, if you're over 40, you probably don't get this. <laughs> and too much of the, of the narrative of Africa is framed for people over 40 in a colonial narrative. Okay. And, what are the, uh, you, well, yeah. Eric, that's probably something we have to dive into later, but it's, it's mainly the social media who are driving this, or, and not the traditional media. No. No, I, uh, I wouldn't say that at all. Uh, the traditional media, I think, is still the dominant creators of the narrative. Um, so that is TV. I mean, especially what we're seeing with how, you, you know, no, it's definitely, it's definitely the broadcast main networks. There isn't that much on social media about China and Africa. Uh, this is still predominantly a, a, a traditional legacy media type discussion that's going on. I mean, I think what I'm doing on social media is probably the largest discussion going on out there on it. But it's not, uh, it's, it's traditional media. And when we talk about the Chinese investments in media in Africa, um, you know, those, those investments that they're making are all in traditional media. And in part because traditional media in Africa is still the dominant media. Social is growing very quickly, but radio and TV are the dominant media. Okay, Lara, can, can you introduce yourself shortly and in relation to the subject here too? Uh, sure. So I um, have been a freelance journalist in China for five years. Uh, I worked for CNN before that in London and Boston, but here I, you know, work for a number of media outlets, including CNN, um, um, uh, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, um, etc. And uh, I also spent a year working um, in the China Daily. Um, I moved to China to study the media industry here and have really become fascinated by its evolution and development. Um, I think, excuse me, not only in China, but more so um, overseas. So um, I, you know, really keen to take part in this discussion um, to sort of hear, you know, what other people are hearing on the ground in Africa. I don't have any direct experience. Um, my understanding um, of the situation regarding Chinese media in Africa and something I'm particularly interested in really stems more from how um, China's journalists are covering Africa and the fact that I hear many correspondents are being sent there with very little experience in terms of how to work in very difficult environments. Um, so that that is sort of my my direct experience and really just mm -hmm. an interest that I have in the, in the topic because I think it's very interesting to see in what ways China's media might change from an external standpoint by um, engaging you know particularly in the de developing world not only from you know more of a systematic approach in terms of um, top down censorship that exists within China but also um, in terms of Chinese reporters now becoming foreign correspondents working side by side with people from CNN and the BBC and many other major media outlets, um, what that potentially means for China's media in the future. Lara, I would, I would discourage you from thinking, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I just make a notation about indeed the experience of, of Chinese journalists as foreign correspondents is uh, an issue I didn't put yet on my list that should be there. Um, I, I, I was in China when the tsunami hit, and this was the first time that apart from the uh, Xinhua people, Xinhua people have been abroad, but well, there, there is still, still some discussion going on whether we should call them journalists or spies or whatever. And, 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 and then for the first time, also more ordinary journalists, they, uh, they found themselves with a, a pile of, uh, of RMB on an airplane to Indonesia to find out that they couldn't do there anything. It was for a lot of them the first experience uh, whatsoever to go out of the country. And, and so it would be interesting to see how the learning process is, is going. We have also River here, River Young. River, you want to listen in or you want to introduce yourself to? I'm sorry, can I just keep silence? I don't totally understand what you are saying. Okay. Okay. Well, we just 
uh, see you as a listener here, right. and, and Eric, maybe f for starters, we can uh, we can have uh, first get an overview of what Chinese media are actually doing in in Africa, because it's a uh, I know uh, only that they have been sending off a lot of money to uh, to invest both in in not only in Africa but also in the U.S. and elsewhere. So can you give us a short overview of who is doing what? Yeah, I mean, I and I, I think the idea that you know, there's this perception that Chinese media now is entirely done by Chinese. And that was really, you know, for many years, CCTV9, uh, you know, was just the world's most dreadful television you've ever seen. I mean, it was, you know, this was the precursor to CCTV News, and it had, you know, these, these Chinese pr presenters who barely spoke English with these awful accents, uh, you know, delivering stilted news. And it was just, it was, it was terrible. Um, and they've learned a lesson now, and they've made a, a real dramatic change, both in Washington and in Nairobi. One of the things you see out of Nairobi is they're not Chinese journalists. They've been poaching uh, some of the best journalists out of the Kenyan media and out of Egyptian media. And so one of the things you see when you watch Africa Live, which is the main CCTV news program out of Africa, is there's very few Chinese on it, if any. Just as when you watch uh, Biz Asia America out of Washington, uh, my good friend Anna Naidu is a former CNN anchor and is a former Al Jazeera anchor. He's now anchoring there. Uh, you know, I've got great friends from France 24 who are producing it at CCTV. You know, they finally woke up and they're starting to recognize that to tell their own story doesn't mean they have to have their own people. So I think it's very important to dissuade ourselves from thinking that Chinese media is now produced by Chinese. 80% uh, of the office in Nairobi is non-Chinese. So the management's Chinese, but the, the editorial staff is, is, is very, very African. This marks a very important point. Oh, sorry. And, and, and they and, and, and they would bring also African news or local news. Well, what they do is they, I mean, this was the whole premise, is that they say they want to tell the story uh, from an African perspective. Um, and, and a lot of these journalists um, are very good journalists, and they're, being give, they're given a much bigger platform than they had in, uh, in Nairobi. Uh, you know, when you don't cover politically sensitive issues related to China, uh, the Chinese will give you a lot more latitude, and in particularly what we're seeing out of these experiments with CCTV in Washington and Nairobi. You know, they're not going to talk about, you know, Tibet. They're not going to talk about, you know, Falun Gong. They're not going to talk about these sensitive issues because it just doesn't come on the agenda that much. You know, I'd be curious to see how they cover the Dalai Lama visit to South Africa. That'll be a test. Um, but they're, they're pushing the limits much more than, than we think they are. And again, they'll do these experiments outside of China, which they won't do inside of China. I think that's a very important distinction. Um, also, CCTV's management is more progressive than Xinhua's. So there is not a uniform management style from within the Chinese media. Each group runs itself differently. And so there's not a consistency that you see. Okay, okay, because I'm still wondering what kind of groups we have. We have CCTV, we have the China Daily, and we have uh, Xinhua. Because, because oh, yesterday no, you, I, I by accident. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on, because I, I, I'm still looking oh, for the overview, Eric. Uh, you, 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 it's complicated. You have Blue Ocean Network, which is a semi private you know, media network that's broadcasting in English. Uh, and then, you know, you've got, you, you know, each of the regional TV channels are pushing out, you know, English language programming. Shanghai TV has got English language programs. Uh, these are available on, on satellite packages now all over the world. Uh, so the, it, 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 I think it's, you know, the idea that you're trying to package this up and have a simple kind of, you know, overview is really an antiquated model of thinking of the Chinese media. It is complicated. It's a very diverse media market. They have different agendas. They're funded differently. They have management styles which are very different. CNC World, for example, uh, which is Xinhua, is terribly managed. I mean, it's just you know out of the 18th century. Whereas CCTV, uh, you know, the the executive management of CCTV, particularly the international side, um, they're sharp as tacks, and they really get it. Um, oh, well, so, so I'm happy so about different. that because yesterday I, I've never seen any of the broadcast from Africa. Uh, I was yesterday uh, by accident because one of our speakers was interviewed by CNC, and that came from Washington, and that was the Xing, that's the Xinhua uh, stuff, and that's dreadful. Like, like yeah, that uh, is dreadful. I, I can imagine that they, that yeah, they should want. 
I, I, I can imagine that they don't want to promote a, a class struggle like Hugo Chavez did. Uh, uh, but they barely made, well, they mentioned him. But they made, the, the most of the important issues in the world they didn't even mention. Like Syria was not there apart from a dodgy uh, 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 proposal from, 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 from uh, the regime there. It, 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 it was really badly done. Yeah, but you have to understand why it's badly done. And it's badly done because at the root of Xinhua, it's not a TV company. It's a, it's a news agency, you know, and it's a, it's a semi-quasi news agency. As you've talked about, it, it has, you know, other more nefarious, you know, roles in the past. I don't know if they still use it that way. Um, but nonetheless, that's not their tradition. It's the same reason why Bloomberg... For, for, for decades produced the crappiest television you've ever seen. You know, Bloomberg's starting to finally get it now, but because Bloomberg was a terminal agency, and they just don't, you know, they don't do it well. Um, so that's part of it, where CCTV has, is much more focused on television, so they produce television better. Now, let, let's kind of not get carried away here. Uh, Biz Asia America and Africa Live are two excellent programs. And one of the problems that I found in Paris among the international news management was how quick everybody was to dismiss CCTV. And I think that's a mistake because they've got heaps of money. They're, lying, they're lining up a distribution platform, which is just mind-blowingly good. Um, in my cable channel, in my cable package in L.A., in Los Angeles, I got you know, CCTV 9 or CCTV News. I mean, so they're, they've, they've, they're lining up distribution. They're going to figure out the content at some point. People wrote off Al Jazeera for the first five years, and you can't write off Al Jazeera now. And, and I think CCTV, parts of CCTV yep. will follow that model. Okay. Well, well, maybe, Larry, you can chip in there, too, because what, 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 what's the strange thing is, I used to be a foreign correspondent myself, and what you do as a foreign correspondent is you collect news that's being used in newspapers, in radio stations, in TV stations back at home, and even CNN. Is actually an American an, an, an American uh, news station for the all the wrong the, the wrong reasons gets a little uh, uh, taste to it. Is it where, where does it come from? This need to uh, to uh, to to uh, to develop media in other other countries than your own. Sorry, sorry, your question, where does the need come to develop? I didn't quite catch your question. Could, would you mind repeating it? Because as a foreign correspondent, you collect news for your home country. Sure. And now these, these, these Chinese media companies, they go out and set up their own enterprises. What, what's the rationale behind that? Uh, well, I think it's quite obvious. Um, you know, um, Maybe there would be disagreement, but I'm, I'm, I think it's part of a bigger soft power strategy that the Chinese government has, you know, really come forward with um, starting around 2000, I think, eight or nine, you started to see media reports about billions of dollars being poured into CCTV, Xinhua, China Daily, um, as part of an effort to really create, uh, really compete, rather, with the dominant global media systems to define, you know, an, their own Chinese voice um, so that they could have news, you know, that wasn't always um, from an American perspective, an American discourse, a European perspective or whatnot. Um, and also, you know, really to try to change China's, um, you know, of course, image abroad. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm really interested into, into the question of, you know, I think many people have said, oh, CCTV and Blue Ocean Network and China Daily um, would really never be viable news networks in the American market because there has been this historical strong narrative of, of these being propaganda, um, you know, organizations working for the Chinese government. But I'm curious what sort of impact they're going to have in um, more of the developing world like Africa. Um, where there maybe is not quite that historical narrative, and um, there, I, I'm, not, I'm not totally familiar with the media systems in Africa, but in maybe an underdeveloped media market where there's a need for content like this, um, you know, whether China can can really get ahead in places like this. Well, well that, that, that's a good question because uh, I, I'll, I'll actually take your first point first, which is the reason why CCTV will not be viable in the United States 
uh, is partially due to the fact that they're Chinese and partially to do with the fact that Americans have no appetite whatsoever for international news. That is why there is no international news network, Western or otherwise. Uh, the BBC doesn't run 24 hours in the U.S. So, so there's just not a market for it. Okay, let's kind of move on from that. Um, elsewhere around the world, there is actually uh, quite a bit of demand for alternative points of view for international news. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's interesting is the way the Chinese are approaching this, um, it's typical Chinese business practices. Undersell your competitor, suffer some losses, and then drive your competitor out of business. I mean, that's what they're doing. So what, one of the things they're doing is they're walking, and they're doing this in South America and here in South Asia. I'm in Vietnam. They don't do it here, but they do it in other countries. Uh, but, but very effective in Africa where they're going to newspapers and they're saying, hey, we'll give you Xinhua, the wire service for free. Yeah. Just take it. Right. As long as you print, and you don't have to print anything you want, but you take it. Now, here you are as a struggling, you know, African media outlet, you know, newspaper, radio, or TV, and you get a free wire service. What are you going to do? Of course you're going to take it. Uh, Xinhua is offering its video feeds. CCTV is offering its video feeds for free. Uh, when I was uh, in, living in Kinshasa, well, there it was, China Radio International. Um, so, so there's two pieces to this puzzle. One, they're building the distribution platform to make it easy for both listeners and media outlets to grab their content. Two, they are, uh, they're, they're, they're actually filling that content with more and more local content. Uh, I worked at France 24 for two years. I was the editor-in-chief of their digital division up until about eight months ago. One of the most interesting things about France 24, which really prided itself on its Africa coverage, was it was 98% white. It was 98% European, you know, and a lot of African viewers look at that and just say that's complete bullshit. So where the Chinese, what they're doing is they're actually poaching off again these local reporters. And I think that tell, and this is the Al Jazeera model. The Al Jazeera model is to hire developing world journalists to help tell the story about the developing and emerging South. And I think that's a very, very smart strategy. Uh, so, so, so that in that sense. There is a receptive audience for this because people, when you turn on, you know, CCTV Africa Live, you actually see Africans, which is something you don't see in the Western media for the most part. Okay, there are two additional questions. Like, I have to ask a very yeah, um, I, you know, can go ahead, Lara. Oh, uh, sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll come back to my point later. No, well, I was wondering. I have to ask a very Chinese question, Eric. Uh, uh, is there also a financial aspect? Is it only uh, uh, government-funded propaganda, even if it's propaganda in, in a very intelligent way? Or is there also um, a, a reason, are they also want to make money? Because, uh, like, like we discussed before, CNN withdrew from many markets because there was simply no money to be made. Is, is, is that an no, aspect they, that also... It's a little bit like, yeah, it's a little bit like Al Jazeera. You know, Al Jazeera, you know, there's a great story about Al Jazeera how, uh, you know, they had no infrastructure to actually take in any money because that's not Al Jazeera's, you know, mission. Uh, Al Jazeera was there to push content out, not to take money in. That's starting to change a little bit. Uh, but so, no, this is not, these are not money-making enterprises at all. These are entirely funded by the state. Uh, they don't have the culture at CCTV be a for-profit enterprise. Uh, none of these organizations have any culture for how to market in a competitive landscape. Without these state subsidies, they would be completely meaningless. Um, let me challenge you again on the use of the word propaganda, because that's a very loaded word when you talk about it in the context of the international media. There's an implication when a Westerner accuses China or Russia or, or France or any state-funded media of, of, of being, because of its relationship to the state, of being propaganda. Now. We all know that CCTV and Xinhua are filled with propaganda, so I'm not going to dispute that point. I'm just going to suggest that private media does not necessarily imply that it's not propagandistic. No, but private media yeah, has I to make money. I, 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 think, I think the debate about, um, about <laughs> propaganda and the media systems in the world today is an entirely different subject. Um, to be honest, um, and I know China gets framed in a certain perspective, but you know, in the West, we have a hard time of self-reflexivity in terms of the way in which our media, be, you know, propaganda-like, also. But I will tell you, um, you know, I, I do have a friend who works for the China Daily, and she is on her first reporting mission to um, Africa right now, and 
um, you, while there is not a, um, you know, while the China Daily, I'm quite sure, is not profiting at all off of um, their expansion in Africa, there is a massive interest in only focusing on reporting, more specifically what Chinese companies are doing in Africa. Um, in fact, my friend was saying how she was trying to push to have more social stories about Chinese people's lives in Africa and I don't know any other sort of relevant social issues, but she was having a very difficult time pushing that through the editorial team because they just wanted only Chinese African business relationships. Um, so maybe there's another way in which people are profiting off of um, you know, this sort of media expansion into Africa that might not be directly going into the pockets of uh, China Daily or other news agencies. Yeah. That probably has to do a, as much with the the perspective of the editors, just as my editors in, in Paris you know, couldn't see beyond their own narrative. You know, I think for a lot of these, maybe these senior Chinese editors, they look at the human story as not that interesting, and they look at the business story because being Chinese business is always more interesting. Um, and that might be just an editorial decision on their part rather than any kind of conspiracy of any kind. Sure, that's, that's, that's true. You've seen the question from did we lose phones? From uh, Winslow, ah. uh, that he, he oh Winslow, our good friend Winslow. No, yeah. Let's see. Are there any anecdotes about the penalty reaction on that? Daily I didn't see it. Can you put it back up again? Sorry. Here, let me let me put it back up myself. Yeah. Yeah. Are they must watch, must read? Uh, I don't think they're at the level of must watch, must read. But one of the uh, you know, I read the other day about surveys how the brand awareness of CCTV is actually growing quite, quite significantly, and that's again due in part to the to the free uh, the free availability of it. However, uh, one has to remember that uh, you know the African media market is an extremely dynamic media market. Um, you know, you go to most African cities, and there are dozens of radio stations. In Kinshasa, there were 52 TV stations, if you can believe it. Uh, this is not, you know, a barren media market by any sense. So, you know, CCTV and China Daily, they have a lot of work cut out for them to, to, to get into these media markets and to capture mind share. Um, they're spending a lot of money. There's a lot of awareness. Um, their video is being used by lots of, uh, of different agencies. And, you know, in Africa, too, throughout the continent, there's a lot of pirating of, uh, of other channels' video. And so what you're seeing now showing up on, the, on local uh, channels all over uh, Zambia and all over uh, Uganda is CCTV video that they just pulled off of the satellite, and which is good for their branding. I mean, that's part of the expansion of it. Piracy has always been a good thing in this sense. Um, so to, to Winslow's question, it's not must watch, must read yet. Um, and I don't know if it'll ever get there because I don't know if people are going to ever be that passionate about China to for a, a must watch, must read. But it's increasingly become part of the media diet in very, very small, selective parts of the uh, of society. But well, we should add a bit on. We we discussed it before we started it that uh, unlike uh, a lot of other countries, including China, social media are not yet that important for the 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 the. the the media uptake in Africa is it? Well, no, no. Let me, let me rephrase that. I'm sorry. I, anyway, I hope you don't misunderstand me. Social media in Africa is incredibly important. Just as it relates to China in Africa, it's not that important. So uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, all of the key social media tools are are very, very popular. As evidenced by the success of the China Africa Project Facebook page, which, as I mentioned, is 80% 18 to 24 year olds from the continent. Who are engaged, who are participating, who talk, who you know. So it's just as it relates to China and Africa media, it's it's really not 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 relevant yet. But there have been a lot of complaints about uh, China's soft power and how poorly they are doing it on the political level and otherwise. Um, is there uh, what kind of message do you think they want to get across uh, through the media efforts? Oh, they're so terrible at soft power, it's just embarrassing to watch. I mean, it's just, but, so on the one hand, there are, there's the Keystone Cops. Um, but he, here's what's interesting. Um, if you asked me five years ago if I ever thought that we'd create a show like Biz Asia America or CCTV Africa Live, uh, I would have told you you're crazy. They never could have done it. And, and I think it's a very, very dangerous thing to do is to underestimate the learning curve that the Chinese have. 
They are extremely adaptable. They are studying other systems very, very well, and they are changing and they are adapting. Um, and so, so yes, it's easy to discount them. They are they are absolutely horrific when it comes to soft power. They are clumsy. They don't have the instincts for it. But we're si we're seeing real signs of, of learning and change. Um, and frankly, frankly. Uh, when you look at who is expanding around the world in media, it's the Qataris, it is the yeah. Chinese, it's the Russians. Um, so I get a little bit indignant when I hear, and again, just this audience excluded, but um, when, you know, I don't see American networks going into Africa. I don't see the British networks investing networks into Nairobi and learning and adapting. I see them playing by their same old rules and retrenching trying to defend their home turfs. So frankly, what the Chinese are doing now as a learning experiment is phenomenal. And they're going to be able to, I think, come out of this, you know, smarter and wiser for it. Lara, what's your take on that? Well, you know, there's actually um, uh, another point that I wanted to bring up um, in terms of the soft power initiative and, and ex experimentation outside of the country. Um, this does not relate directly to Africa, and maybe Eric, you can speak to an Africa perspective on it. Um, I, I had mentioned prior to um, this discussion that I had recently been in Myanmar, and I met with um, a, a few local journalists there. And of course, China and Myanmar have a rather tenuous relationship, and the Burmese actually don't like Chinese all that much. And the Chinese embassy there um, recently held what I was told, this may not be completely accurate, was their first ever press conference for local journalists who were invited to learn more about whatever issue, um, which I thought was interesting, this sort of, um, you know, concerted effort to reach out, um, you know, in a foreign country and to try to be more transparent and to literally, what I was told was to force these journalists to ask, ask them questions. Um, so I think, you know, even from a kind of a government um, outreach perspective, it's very interesting, you know, the fact that they realize they have to do this to try to engage with even local journalists, whereas in, you know, in China, um, you hear foreign correspondents, of course, complain all the time that you can never talk to the government about anything that is very difficult to do. But the fact that they're making this effort in Myanmar and perhaps elsewhere, um, I think, is another um, facet of Chinese media abroad um, that, you know, warrants monitoring. Yeah, I mean, in Africa, what I've noticed is that the, the embassies are, are very difficult to penetrate for media. Uh, and that's in part because the, it, it really depends on the ambassador. And that's very similar to, to the American role. If you have a very powerful ambassador who's politically connected, they're much more comfortable speaking to the media uh, than a, a more of a functionary and a bureaucrat. So, for example, you know, Liu Guijing, who is the former ambassador to South Africa, who is now known as Mr. Africa by the Chinese. He's the head of Africa policy for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, when he was in Pretoria, you know, he would talk to the media very comfortably, but that's because he had a strong power base and he had the confidence to do that. So I have, it really, I think, goes from embassy to embassy. There is not a culture of public diplomacy uh, yet in, in the Chinese uh, diplomatic service like we see in the West. Uh, however, again, um, if you call what the Americans do public diplomacy being effective, and I've worked with the State Department directly, it's a joke. Um, so, so I don't, again, think that, you know, we are any kind of model on this front. Um, if you've ever tried to interview an American diplomat, some of the hoops you have to go through are, are quite extreme as well. So you, you think, well, Larry, you have been working with the, uh, uh, the China Daily and some others. Uh, Eric is, uh, it says it's, it's mainly a learning curve we have to go through. And you think the, the China Daily is able you go through that learning curve? Um, I think they're fumbling through it right now, to be um, very honest with you. Um, some of the journalists that they, and they are, by the way, sending purely Chinese journalists to Africa at this point. Um, I think on occasion they'll send sort of some, you know, white British guy to accompany a Chinese journalist because of his perception that, oh, he might know more about Africa than someone from Beijing would, which I think is probably absolutely not the case. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, they're sending people there, maybe even somewhat forcing people to go there um, and work at this point. And I, I just think they're, they are learning. Um, but uh, CCTV sounds like 
compared to China Daily. It's just totally different stages of, of development. And my impression of what's going on at China Daily right now is that it is a bit clumsy. Um, just kind of sending people to Africa because maybe they had studied abroad for a semester at college, um, you know, in Australia, so, oh, they have overseas exper experience. There's a lot of weird justification for sending certain correspondents um, over there. And uh, it's, uh, I, I don't get the sense that there's a really clear vision of how to tackle the country yet. Um, I have not personally seen a copy of their Africa edition, um, but it definitely seems like you know a work in, pro in progress and just kind of trying to figure things out at this point. Just well, like let me what, tell you about what's in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, but about just to, to follow up on China Daily, I wouldn't put any faith or hope or you know optimism in the in the China Daily reporters that they're sending over there because as you're right, they're it, it's it's really just awful. Um, but what the China Daily's and I've seen a noticeable change just in the past six months with the China Daily is the, 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 the tone and the, and the types of freelancers and, and op-ed contributors that are, that are, that are participating in the, in the newspaper has radically changed. Uh, they work with a journalist by the name of Mark uh, Kepchang, I think it's Kepchangas, his name is a Kenyan, uh, and he writes just really great stuff. Uh, they're, they're pulling out professors to write op-eds out of the, the China, um, the African scholars in, in Beijing who are writing really, really top stuff. So they're bringing in other voices, again, you know, particularly to their African edition, um, and that's something that's encouraging. Um, and th these are very interesting reads, and I post the best stuff, you know, on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, so, and I'm, I'm actually mildly surprised. So the, the interesting part is maybe not coming from the editorial staff, but coming from the, the freelance and the editorial contributors. That sounds pretty encouraging. Do you think, Eric, some of these good developments you, you have been describing here are also spilling over into the uh, domestic reporting in China? Um, yeah, I mean, I find the domestic reporting in China is increasingly becoming a lot more like it is in the U.S., where it's kind of pack reporting and herd reporting, and as the, as the networks become more competitive with one another, they're going to follow each other a lot more. Um, and again, I don't think there's a lot of consistency you know, from Hunan to Shanghai to Beijing to Guangzhou, there's, you know, these are different media markets. The provincial media markets are behaving differently. Um, so it's difficult to kind of, it's, this is a very big, you know, pie now to kind of say that it's, it's doing one thing or another. Um, but I do suggest that, that it's changing so much faster than people appreciate. I would contend that social media is probably having a bigger impact on, 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 on traditional media in China than, than almost anything else. That they're fo they're following the lead of Weibo, Tencent, and QQ as as much as anything else. Okay, well, it's it's it, it sounds all very encouraging, and I'm I'm, I'm we, we're certainly going to follow this this media development here, um, uh, uh, as we have to follow many other things. Like we don't want to make the the mistake a lot of traditional media are making and leaving Africa out altogether. Well, obviously, China, Russia, and Qatar are, uh, have di have discovered Africa too, and maybe it's a good idea to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, come back on the subject every every now and then with you, Eric and Lara. Any closing remarks? Because well, we're over the time. Uh, uh, we don't want to uh, to uh, take too much from the attention. Uh, I thought it was very uh, very revealing. Some more. Th I'm following Eric a bit on what he's doing in Africa, and uh, I learned a bit. So it, well, I, I, no, my no. only closing remark is to say that it's it, everything. It's far more complex than we think, and oftentimes people fall back to their kind of their established narratives in their mind of what they think it was 15, 20 years ago, and today it's radically different. Um, I just invite everybody to join our discussion. We do a podcast every week on this. It's available on iTunes. We have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter page. Um, we have got a blog at ChinaAfricaProject.com where we're translating Chinese social media on the subject. And also, we're, we're next week we're launching a Weibo account in Chinese. So, um, you know, there's a great discussion going on, and I hope that people can check it out. Well, it's fully justified propaganda, Eric. <laughs> uh, Lara, any closing remarks? Um, well, I will add that I am uh, on the board of directors of a nonprofit media organization called the Global Press Institute. And we train women and 
developing countries to be journalists and we hire them to work for us. Write stories for local and then we syndicate it in the West as well. And we're now working on a China program to bring Chinese over to Africa to work on our news desks with African reporters and first-hand experience and a deeper understanding of the um, landscape there. So that's part of my interest in this discussion. And Eric, maybe we can follow up afterwards. I'd love to talk to you more. Um, so, sure. you know, it's a really fascinating topic, um, for sure. And I think it's something that should be closely followed, um, you know, now and, and for many years to come. Thank you very much, both, for participating here. And Winslow for his comments. Uh, on, uh, on Twitter. Um, well, we're coming back to Africa and the media again. So next week, as promised, we uh, will focus on, on the Hong Kong media. And, and, but we, I'm, I'm sure we will see uh, all of you uh, uh, very soon.